Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to My First Business, the podcast. I'm your host, Naeem Parvez, and I'm a relatively new and sometimes clueless business owner. And I wanted to talk to seasoned entrepreneurs to help guide me and inspire me and help me understand the best way to grow my own business. So I wanted to learn about what mistakes to avoid, how to overcome common challenges, and how to identify opportunities. And that's why I created this show for you, dear listener. So if you're running a new business or an old one, I don't care. I'm not an ageist. I bring on guests from all sorts of industries and they are full of wisdom that you'll chew right up. And each episode is going to be like a conversation with a mentor that you never had. This episode is brought to you by Digitalina. Now, I might be a bit biased as the owner of the business, but I think we've cracked the code when it comes to lead generation for service-based businesses. My co-founder, who also happens to be my wife, and I have spent years building out our own system of advertising that gets businesses new, high-quality leads, day in and day out, all on autopilot. To find out if we can do this for you and what kind of results you can expect, Let's schedule a free discovery call using our website. That's www.digitalina.io. That's D-I-G-I-T-A-L-I-N-A dot I-O. Now, without further ado, let's get on to the episode. Welcome, Tash. Thanks for having me. Welcome to my first business. I'm going to quickly introduce you for the guests that may not know you, although everyone in Dubai probably knows you already. My guest today is Natasha, or Tash, as she likes to be known. Uh, Tash has over 20 years experience in the marketing, media, and PR world. Tash was born and educated in the UK and holds a PhD in psychology and marketing. I guess that makes you a doctor? Yes, a doctor of shopping, almost. Doctor of shopping, I like that. And she has a genuine passion for people and understanding what makes them tick, so that makes the two of us. Tash's experience spans clients in many sectors, beauty, fashion, automotive, FMCG, travel, financial, retail, you name it. But lately, uh, I believe you're niching down into the beauty, health and wellness space. Uh, Her CV includes massive names like McCann Erickson Worldwide, Euro RSCG, Havas Global, Gloreal and Diageo. Tash moved to the region in 2010 and having spent some time working with Abu Dhabi Media, She took a leap of faith, setting up her own boutique beauty and wellness communications agency, drumroll, Tishtash, in 2012, and hasn't looked back since. In 10 years, Tishtash has become one of the most sought after and respected independent agencies in the Middle East. In a nutshell, they create campaigns that get brands noticed. Uh, Tash has also scooped up a bunch of awards along the way, the PRCA Middle East Best Agency Award for 2021, the PR Leader Award for 2022, and the Gulf Capital Business Leader Award for 2021. The agency purposely remains boutique in size, which we will explore uh, later, working selectively with the best and the brightest brands in the industry. The current agency clients include ASICS, The Body Shop, Bath & Body Works, Kipsons, Lego, Medcare, Neil's Yard, Mamas & Papas, Gap, Victoria's Secret, and Faces Middle East, to name just a few. And this year, we will be talking about Tash opening up in uh, UK and Saudi Arabia as well. Tash, I have one word for you. Wow. (laughs) That intro just makes me go, wow, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. That Uh, intro just makes me feel old. (laughs) Makes you feel accomplished and like, okay, I'm done. Like you guys handle the rest of the business. I've done what I had to do. (laughs) You could be on your way. There's a lot of places we can go in this conversation. And majority of this is surrounded around business talk, but... I want to start somewhere random. A little birdie told me that you're working on a book. I am. Do you want to tell us about the book? Um, I think if uh, for me, one of my bucket list things in my life is to write a book. It has always been. um, uh, And I've had numerous attempts at writing a book, even when I lived in London um, over, you know, like 15 years ago, I quit my job and I said, I'm going to go write a book. And I sat in a, you know, in my small flat in London on my own, you know, not earning for six months writing a book. And it was terrible. I think I started off well. And then I can see as my mental health went downhill as the uh, six months 
else went on. So, um, and then since then, I've had a couple more attempts at writing a book. Um, n- honestly, not as easy as anyone t- you know you think it will be. Um, but now I do feel the time is right. Um, I've been. I started actually working on it before COVID. Then COVID hit, and I think obviously that threw a lot of our lives out. Um, but my book, um, which is on the preliminary title of Ice Gold Lattes: A Year of Drama in the uh, PR World of the Middle East, is um, all about um, what, well, as it says, you know, it is a year in the life of a PR person in the Middle East. And I do. No one's really covered that industry in the Middle East, and I think it is some of the experiences I've had in the past twelve years living here been amazing and I really definitely think you know without I don't want it to be it's not aimed to be naming or shaming or um you know that's definitely not my um you know aim with it it really is just to be I looked at other people whose books I love like Alexandra Shulman's A Year in Vogue and the way she did it was very observational and very very positive in the way she talked about things and that's the kind of vibe I'm going with my book um, but obviously I have got some outrageous stories as well um, but I will be doing it in I, for me I wanted it to be a positive um, book um, I'm 22 chapters in and I have 44 in total I have every single one planned out I have post-its color coded and a really big book board uh i had all these plans like you know in covid where we're all like you know use this time to do something that you know uh, you know you don't usually get time for well you know like most of us are in a business we were trying to save our businesses in the you know in the in covid make sure our staff were paid and things like that so my book didn't get written written in covid i don't think i actually wrote any and then generally i find because i write for a living and i'm always on my laptop the last thing i want to do at any spare time i get is write a book um but no no i'm very very passionate about my book and it will get written it probably won't be this year um and i have got quite a few publishers interested already without even really trying so uh, i'm very excited that's awesome who's the book for who would you um who's in your mind uh, as uh, the readers i think i don't i mean everyone just assumes like loads of people in my industry or even like yeah. bloggers or media are like really excited to read it but i think even a lot of my friends who have nothing to do with our industry and they really but they find my job fascinating or they think that i have this really cool glamorous job that's a whole other story um i, I think it it could be anyone that's really interested in a different career or in I think a lot of obviously you know we you know we work with brands that people know we work with celebrities and things like that so I think there's a lot of very mainstream in terms of it is kind of you know something we actually have um you know and the plan is it is written in a, in a kind of more of a fictional kind of you know storytelling way so I think it would nice. be a really good light book even for someone on a holiday you know on a sun lounger that's never even doesn't know anything about my industry so it's a cross between a memoir a little autobiography a little peek into the business world yeah i think so i mean i yeah. kind of didn't really want it to make it like you know tash world it's kind of that wasn't really kind of what i wanted to yeah. do with it um but no i definitely think that is uh you know that's the kind of vibe i was going for okay well let's jump into the business side of things i i'm gonna hold you accountable to finishing that book uh Thank hopefully you. please do next year you say that's your target yes. okay so this year by december please send me your first draft <laughs> Um, December 31st, just marking that down. Love a bit of accountability. Yeah. Oh, well, you're going you're gonna to get some emails from me. <laughs> um, okay. So I want to go a lot of different places when it comes to business, all the way from when you started to where you are today. And in preparation of this, um, I was thinking of um, questions that will kind of give it a structure, but really the way my mind works, have you seen the movie Memento? Yes. So I kind of go all over the place. Okay. So we we'll expect a bit of a left turn and U turns. I but think I'm a bit like that too. So you know, awesome. who knows what ride will go on? So okay, yeah. cool. So if we if we ha- I have to ditch my structure, we'll we'll do that. But we'll start off at the start. So uh, I call this section the considerations. I want to ask you, take you back to that time when you were starting Tish Dash. Um, one particular thing: your friends, your family, your colleagues, your ex bosses. What were the reactions of the people in your life that you consider important, that you listen to? What advice were they giving you? What objections were they putting? How did they take it? How, how did people respond to Tash saying, hey, I'm going to go off on my own and do this thing? What was the reaction like? I think it varies. Um, and I always say something that I believe really wholeheartedly is one of the reasons I love the UAE is that I find people here are very, they have, I would say they have 10 reasons to do things. Whereas if I, you know, 
go to my home country, the UK, I find everyone's got 10 reasons to not do things. And that very much, I would say, sits with the reactions that I got from people. So if I go to my family, you know, I'd had a really, really successful career, you know, amazing jobs, amazing salaries. And then, yeah, all of a sudden I was like, I'm going to go and, you know, go to yoga, do a bit of work and travel the world and have a bit of life flexibility. And so my parents are both professional, um, you know, successful people. My my dad's very very kind of old school and so they were a bit like what are you doing in a foreign country you know um but um and then flip side you know friends here I had friends that had businesses I probably out of my main circle was one of the first to go on their own um but everyone was you know super super um supportive and um you know they really really are encouraging my bosses so my old bosses even be it whatever they were like you know a lot most of them pretty much were like if anyone's going to do it you're going to do it and they're really encouraging um and then my current boss at the time who I quit was like you can't do that I don't have anyone with your skill set you need to stay um and I kind of was like well I don't um but then I ended up working out a little deal so I stayed for six months and kind of supported them on a bit of freelance so um but yeah really really mixed but I would say genuinely everyone you know I think uh, if I look back I always had these um even though I was always like I'm going to be a lawyer I'm going to be like a psychiatrist all these things I'd always on the side had this really kind of entrepreneurial side like I was that person who was maybe had like a little talk shop thing going you know at school where I was like you know or I was sort of um then even on my on the side of my career in the UK I used to paint and I had my paintings in galleries and I was always um you know and I actually had a really good business doing that as well so I've always had been doing something and I think I always had it in me for a, either say a side hustle at the time but obviously to do something on my own terms um but that was kind of really sort of where it kind of started what what was your first ever business or what would you qualify as your first ever business was, no i think it was literally was it like painting? no 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 it was literally when i was probably about 11 and we were all um i don't know there was this kind of thing at school we had to have i don't know that you know they were trying to tell us teachers about you know business but anyway yeah so me and my friend we had this little tuck shop thing that we used to run at school and selling like snacks and things so um i don't even yeah, yeah and we used to actually make quite good money on it that's amazing so, yeah. um I have a similar story because I was, I think I was in ninth grade and just a year before my O-levels. Um, not proud to say this, but I was selling pirated CDs to friends of a, of a very popular show, which has friendship as a main topic. <laughs> There's three dudes, three ladies in New York. I don't know if you can figure it out. I didn't give away too much, but yeah, we've been, I, I feel like everyone that I've talked to the start of the business has experimented lightly at some point, even very intentionally not by mistake, but um, Tish Tash is a business. Would you say that's accidental or very, very intentional? Very accidental. Yeah. Um, I My plan was truly after I'd been working really hard, very stressful jobs in the corporate world, I, I know I, I was tired and I, you know, I, I did want more life balance and that was my goal was to, and I joke all the time about, I was going to yoga, I was going to get my nails done and I was going to have life balance. And then, you know, fast forward 10 and a half years, you know, and the reality is I haven't been to yoga. Most of the time my nails are chipped and I haven't even washed my hair, you know, I'm like, uh, and that's the reality. Yeah. I didn't, uh, you know, I, I, I talk a lot at the moment about like legacy and building a brand and things like that but that was not actually my plan my plan was as simple as that um and then it was I you know that was in the January you know I got I got my trade license in the December but January I went out there new year by the March I had too many clients um you know I couldn't handle and then one of my friends and my old colleagues came and joined me and then it really has kind of like you know we ended the first year of business you know we'd won all of Johnson & Johnson beauty for the Middle East which is a you know in your first year of business you know that was amazing um, and, and that definitely was one of the kind of pivotal moments for us so and then from there it kind of you know just every year it was you know okay and then we, you get to two years and then it's actually we have now we need to hire some junior members of staff and well you can't really have junior members of staff working from home and you need to give them a career experience so oh okay we now we need an office and then you know you upgrade to you know a, a different license you know a DED license and then you get an office and then I always joke as soon as you get an office and you go to that then you never you know you pretty much never have as much money as you did the first year you're even as business because you're just paying for people and uh, you know office 
classes and things like that um but no no definitely my journey was in terms of where I you know people think that I started out with this plan to you know I mean now I have yes Tish Tash is a brand in itself and I did that for a number of reasons but was that my plan totally not my you know Tish Tash one of the things people will say to me is how did you you know think of your name for your business and I sat there for two weeks when I was doing my trade license didn't know what the heck I was going to call it it's really hard you do all these things you know the name randomizers and things where you try and find they're all terrible and so and then I kind of like was thinking okay it's it doesn't really matter it's about you know I'm going to freelance so it can be called anything people are going to buy me anyway and then I thought you know what my grandfather always called me as my nickname when I was growing up was Tish Dash and that was what you know and I'm super cl- well I was super close to my grandfather and he's probably one of the most instrumental people in my life and you know so he always called me that with affection um he you know he'd already um and he was still alive at that point and I thought you know what that to me is everything I wanted to do was very personal I wanted to have a brand that was about people and making the difference and giving that personal touch with everything we did and so yeah I called it Tish Tash not thinking too much of it um and then sort of fast forward now you know I will walk down I'll go into ITP and everyone's like hey Miss Tish Tash and it's kind of you know become a it has become a brand in its own right and we have spin-offs and different things as well that you know even I mean it's silly things like um well, we haven't talked about Tash Tots that's, no, that's well, exactly thing, yeah. you know yeah. but I you know my mom so I mean, a couple of things you know that the moments where you sort of you really make you realize that you have built a brand and have built something and it wasn't the plan is I was in um, went to Nespresso with my mom at Christmas she was going to buy me and my husband a new Nespresso maker for our new place and then I was like you know you write out your car but your name on and I put in like you know my um, email address and the lady behind the counter was like oh my god you work for Tish Tash they have like the best brands and they're like you know I, and I really want to work at Tish Tash and I was kind of like you and I said, like, oh, and I was like, oh, I own Tish Tash. And then she kind of had this kind of like moment. And I'm like then like super embarrassed as well because I genuinely, you know, I'm quite sort of shy and I'm kind of like, I do sort of sometimes struggle with that side of things. And then my, but my mum was there going like after all these, you know, things of particular, we're not sure I was doing the right thing. And by then she was like, oh, that's my daughter. And then likewise, my MD, um, you know, she was at Expo once and like someone came up to her and, and like going, oh, you're from Tish Tash, you know? And so it's kind of like, I feel like we have got that obviously whilst we are obviously a communications agency and we do do a lot of you know um but the brand in itself has got a life of its own now and lots of different spin-offs that's awesome i was very much smiling throughout that because i can relate to that so much so this beautiful lady that's sitting in the corner there has almost the exact same story accidental businesswoman she just took on too much work that she can handle before she knows that she has a brand and she's hiring people and making training manuals and figuring out salary and office spaces. And, you know, two and a half years later, we were like six people um, and waking up every day to, I just wanted to do yoga. <laughs> she wanted to travel the world, be on a laptop, live the nomadic lifestyle. So I think very, very, very similar kind of things there. I wanted to ask you, but I think you might have answered already. If you have a different answer, go ahead for that. But what was that first moment in your journey that you realized that you're onto something good? Was it the Johnson & Johnson Award there? Was it, I mean, that's up to you. What, yeah. what do you think was your first moment where you're like, okay, I'm onto something good here. I need to continue this. I think lots of different moments. Um, I'm trying to think of really where it kind of, uh, what where, where I stopped telling everyone that I was going to yoga, you mean? <laughs> um, I know, I mean, I definitely think it was when we, you know, when we started getting, you know, sort of, people actually hunting us out and wanting to work with us rather than us kind of going out through contacts and things uh, I mean definitely yeah winning kind of your first flagship client like that on a global brand you know there's definitely a moment um, you know I mean I still honestly think like that day when you hold your first office key in your hand um that you know that's kind of there's no real going back at that stage uh and so that i think that will always be even now when i see flashbacks on social media like holding those keys up it is something which really uh kind of you know resonates with me and i think something which i kind of you know slightly off topic but something i talk to my friends a lot about now is a lot of people come to me now and say i want to start up a business um you know or i want to you know i want to work for myself and, and ask my advice and i am always now like 10 and a half years on and reflecting on and what I learned I think you have to make that decision on why you want to work for yourself and really really have some soul searching because I think there is if you want to you know there's two different paths so if you actually want to build a brand 
and a legacy and ultimately build something which long term has a value and that you can I mean I mean all of us want to you know build something of value to be able to obviously sell and then retire eventually you know there's that path but actually there are other people that genuinely want to be able to earn a decent income that supports their life but also that flexibility maybe is around a family or whatever it's around you know as soon as you step up and you have offices staff and things like that then there is your journey becomes very different than actually if you just want to actually have some clients you love working on and you earn a good you earn good money um and so I always say like just you've got to be really careful which you know what decisions you make because ultimately that will affect the future you know your future path um I mean I say now like you know I've had 10 and a half years I've pretty much most people know me I mean yes I am a bit of a workaholic but I love my business and I have worked seven days a week 20 hour days you know I am a 5am club person I am you know I I will do whatever I have to do for my business and not everyone is cut out for that and not everyone uh, you know but that's what I've done and yes there's been sacrifices along the way you know I haven't sometimes I have sat there on a Friday or now a Saturday watching people at brunches and watching people out and it's and on my desk uh, or you know watching people take the entire summer off in Dubai like now where everyone's away um and you know kind of that isn't something that isn't something I've been able to do or I've made a choice to do something which obviously so I think it is you know thinking about the really 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 soul searching and working out why you're doing it is so important because the rest of it will get dictated by that decision yeah, and you, t- you talked about like giving that advice to people who want to start. I um, want to take you back to that time for more advice for them specifically. So there's a bridge of entrepreneurship, or I, I like to call it the bridge of entrepreneurship, where there's a massive drop off of people who think they want their business and the ones that actually end up doing it. And I wanted to ask you, what was in that, when you were on that bridge, what were your biggest fears Um, What was the biggest challenge internally you had to find yourself? What were the risks you were outlining for yourself, if any? And um, what was the case for, don't do this, Tash, don't do this right now? So what helped you cross that bridge? What were your considerations at that point? What were you fearful about? I mean, I think like most, you know, money is always one of the biggest factors. And Mm -hmm. I think not only just mean basic stuff like, okay, am I going to be, am I going to starve? Am I going to be out? I mean, I live in one of the most expensive cities in the world. Can I pay my rent? Um, so those really practical considerations were definitely on my mind. Uh, I think also, you know, I got to a stage as well in my career where I had very good jobs. I had a lot of high income. I had a lifestyle. And then, you know, it is that kind of, you know, OK, am I ever going to be able to afford to buy myself a handbag again? Or I mean, that sounds I mean, I joke about that, but it is, you know, it is when, you know, you've got a lifestyle and kind of like, am I going to, you know, be, ever be able to go out for dinner again? You know, um, and then, you know, for, I mean, so there were the basic kind of considerations but obviously you know I had savings and I had um you know I did have um you know like I said I I was although that wasn't when I actually first made the leap I didn't know I was going to get freelance from my previous employer obviously that happened which helped me a lot um so I think um you know very very basic considerations I I also you know for me I think I'd always work with the best brands the best companies and I I guess my goals and I I don't know I mean whilst I wanted to make a difference to smaller businesses and be able to bring the best of my big brand and big agency experience I also you know being honest I wanted to work on cool brands I wanted to work on great projects so yeah it was that reality and I always think it's kind of joking you know before I know it you know I'll be working on marketing a garden center or something you know it's like oh you know I think I did have aspirations for what kind of clients I wanted to work on as well um and I mean I and I talk about like imposter syndrome all the time you know because I really feel this is you know most of us kind of struggle with this and it was that even though you know you can look back at your career and tick boxes okay you know got three degrees got like you know worked for all these top companies but then you still think actually well what happens if I I can't you know I can't do it myself or I fail or and I think um you know that kind of thinking knowing that you have that in you to run a business and to um you know to create something yourself and not you know staff because you can't you know afford to feed yourself and things uh, so I think that you know that was something that I battled with as well the confidence to actually um you know just take it forward yeah no I I relate um, a lot to what you've said is <clears throat> the biggest uh consideration is are you going to be able to keep up to your lifestyle that you've already built up and 
it's funny people think it's very rosy you have your own business right like i was at my barber's yesterday and he's like chatting to me and asked hey what do you do I said run my own business and he grants me this praise like wow you're a business guy i'm like no i've never made less money in my life i've always made more money working for other people it's not that glamorous i don't get the same amount of sleep as i used to or the quality of the sleep is not the same so that's i think it's really important for people to understand the the sacrifices that you make that that voice in your head that is stopping you from becoming an entrepreneur you need to listen to it because it's telling you that it's going to be tough and may, maybe you get lucky and maybe everything works out you have the right connections the right funding the right team everything just fits like a good puzzle from the start or you're kind of building from scratch which in case in your case you've you've done straight from scratch and moving on to the next topic building from scratch your kind of business the service business that you're in even though your service can be modeled to be repeatable but there's a element of freshness that needs to be in every campaign that you do for your client and it's not a one person job so you realize you have to build a team i want to ask about team questions because these are some things that we constantly think about um let's jump forward and say you found good people and i'm going to assume we all just know when we found good people right you just know in your heart in your deepest gut that this is the right person what do you do to retain them how do you think about that how do you figure out what is it that they would need to stick with us longer and how do you go out of your way or in a normal way to provide them what they need to retain them and also while you're answering that how has your thinking on this retention changed from let's say the last 5 years to now um people and hr is one of the hardest things in having a business um i i always say that the things i thought were going to be a problem opening a business weren't and the things i you know um had no idea about or thought would be fine um you know were and i definitely think yeah i i took for granted um you know i'm not a hr manager that's not necessarily uh, you know and, and but then when you're a business owner you become everything you're an accountant you're a hr manager and i think people um yeah i mean it's one of i run my business from a people first point of view um and this is something that i talk about a lot um i think if you you know other companies run from like a client first point of view for example but for me when i talk about pe- people and my team first i really believe that if you put your people first and they're happy then the rest will follow you will have happy clients you will make money etc cetera, etc cetera. and um i i mean i i i genuinely i i can't stress this enough to people in terms of i think it, it, you know and covid was one of the key times i think where we saw this because how did people look after their people in covid you know you even look at some of for example um you know big companies you know, who treated their staff terribly um you know but people remember that they may actually still be employed by them today but most of them are working on their exit plan or they remember or their loyalty is a little bit less um so if you come from a place of people first um and i i think for me um for i go with gut instinct on people as well very much like i know straight away um you know who i want to work with um and and so skill set is, is as as important to me as the right person i th- look at my my md for example polly now she um is amazing she didn't join me as md she came in as a senior director when i first met her i was introduced to her i just she just moved here from singapore had the most amazing cv i couldn't i you know when we met each other through a mutual friend she said, you've got to meet each other you really get on and i i loved her from straight away but ultimately i couldn't afford her um you know that was like 6 years ago um and still then you know we were still like the kind of salary she wanted working on global brands was very different but obviously she just moved to dubai as well didn't have regional experience and so anyway we love meeting each other both kind of you know we couldn't make it work at that time and then roll forward 2 months and i couldn't get her out of my mind and i know that sounds like kind of you know but it was kind of um i know she was like the one that got away and then i just reached out to her and i said like you know like i don't know what's what's you know happening with you now but i haven't been able to stop thinking about you and i you know just i i i think i i think you're what i need and then she was like well actually i'm still not doing anything <laughs> i'm just doing bits of freelance and i feel exactly the same way i haven't been able to stop thinking about you either so you see you can have kind of like love affairs even in like you know uh you know it, with your colleagues as well or kind of people that you want to bring in your business and yeah. uh and so yeah we made it work she came in to start with three days a week we found a way to make it work and then by even a month later she'd helped me win enough business that we could pay for her full time and then the 
rest is very much history you know she's you know been with me through the the worst the best um i adore her and you know we you know and now she's our managing director and um you know i i call her my work wife and i can't imagine my life without her I, you know i just love her um so you know and but both of us are very very similar in our approach to people one of the other things that i um you know and the, and the reality is people are going to move on as well you know when people have careers and i always say to my team you know i you know i would love to keep you here but ultimately i've moved around i've worked in different i've worked in-house i've worked in agency and i very firmly believe as well in like exiting someone from your business as well as you onboard them you know these kind of things where because that's their lasting memory of you and everything and that's why we we have had quite a few team members have gone away and come back as well um and i'm very you know i something that i do which um i have wednesdays is my one-on-one day I, um, you know, when we had 10 people, it was obviously, it was still quite a busy day to fit everyone in. They come in with their cup of tea and we go through everything, work, personal. And because you do that week on, week in, week out, you you know if there's anything wrong with anybody. You can sense if they're off their game and you know them well enough. So I kind of wanted to make sure I had a personal relationship with every single person in my team. And, uh, you know, and that weekly check-in was really, really important. Now, obviously, we're over 40 staff and yet I still do Wednesday one-on-ones Polly do it and I do it together and and it is an intense day and yes by the end of it I think both of us need a bit of therapy and a lie down but every I credit this as being one of my things for success is that I you know I never wanted to be a company where there was people in my office that I didn't know who they were and I didn't know who, what their name was. And so regardless of whether they're an intern to a senior director, you know, they have one-on-one time with me and Polly every week where, you know, we know what they're doing, you know, even like in their personal life, you know, I mean, I know, you know, if they're, you know, they're going through breakup issues or whether they're, you know... Or, and they asked me advice on personal and work things as well. And so this to me is a key thing for keeping people happy. It is in terms of at least they know that you care they know that they have access to you and you know your your finger is on the pulse of your business so you know if there's issues early and you can address it and and you know it's not to say that I you know get things right all the time I mean you know I'm still I say I'm winging it you know I didn't aim to have a business I didn't especially you know I didn't aim to have a business the size I have I didn't aim to have offices in different countries i was genuinely going to yoga and uh, and so how's that working out for you terrible (laughs) um and you know even though i literally advocate for health and wellness and this is what i've got loads of yoga studios that i represent i could go to any time i don't go to them um and but it is you know i i'm doing you know doing the best i can and i do always come from a place of people first even if i do get it wrong now and again Uh, and i think that makes the difference that people actually people can tell if you actually care about them and then that kind of you know uh, and um you know as i said you know regardless of yes people come and go but i have relationships with uh, you know uh, pretty much all people that have left tish tash and um you know i kind of i take it really seriously in terms of i know having had i mean we've probably all come from a place right we've had a terrible boss we've had a terrible experience and then that's makes you learn what you don't want to be when you either are a manager or you're a boss and i am always like i you know I've had to fire some people you have to fire people when you own a business and that is you know and I've actually cried in a cupboard like afterwards because I feel like the terror the most terrible person alive when I've cut someone's livelihood short but ultimately if it is the wrong job for them or they've done that you know there's they've had multiple warnings and it just isn't you have to fire people um and I can I ask about that just interject like how do you know when their time is up when what what is your moment of clarity when you know that they're no longer fit to be with the company I think I've learned a lot on here as well because I think for a long time I was very guilty of keeping people a lot longer than I should it's like almost like they're like oh I just like them they're really nice that they're, they're pretty useless but I really like them as humans and so I'll just keep them there accepting that they can't even do the basic job and you kind of even though as I am very human with, and I do put people first ultimately you have to realize and rein yourself in that you are a business and so if someone can't do the job and actually often the time is it's because it is the wrong job for them it isn't necessarily sometimes you know I've Absolutely. had pe- I've had people in my team who been me say two years and they love tish tash they like love the atmosphere they love you know all of the things we do they love the team members they're like hanging out with their mates every day 
do they love the PR job? Is that the career for them? No, it's not. And so, and you can see that as well. And so I've actually, some of my people I know laugh at me because for example, one of my team, I sent emails out to all my contacts saying, look, I've got this really, really great person that works for me. She's been here two years and she is an amazing, but this is the wrong job for her. But I think she'd be perfect for you. And they're like, this is the most bizarre email I've ever received. But I kind of, you know, but actually I helped get her into a role which was a better for her and she's very happy now and, and she's flourishing exactly yeah. and so and likewise you know I had one of my team who wanted to she actually did a degree in psychology that was what she wanted to do and she needed to get work experience you know, she was she came kind of as a an intern then she kind of ended up staying a bit longer uh, but then she ultimately wanted to go and you know be a psychologist but obviously one of my clients is Lighthouse Arabia one of the best mental health um, you know centres here and so I got her onto their graduate a trainee program um, because I knew that ultimately she, PR was not where she wanted to be she wanted to be a psychologist uh, and so I'm very much like, even if someone's not meant to be with me it's like you know okay well I know this person and kind of uh, I just genuinely you know as I said so you, you get a gauge of whether people are in the right or wrong place um, but no I, in the past I made mistakes in terms of I kept people a lot longer than I should have done now all those kind of you know I mean we've all read a million business books when you're trying to you know you've, I've got stacks of kind of you know self-help and business books and that was it like um, higher slow fire fast yeah. uh, and I do actually believe that is true so that I definitely buy into that and I am um, so now I am I do you know, even generally, like when people come in, obviously in probation, I would say generally within the first month, I've got, you know, if they really are not cut out for the job, they will go within the first month, um, however clinical that sounds. Um, but I think going back to what the point I was saying before is I am very, very aware of the decisions that I make and the way that you treat people early on in their career can completely change the course of their career. Um, you know, I mean, I know that you know, there's someone that I work for who, even if I saw today, 20 years on, I'm so traumatized by that person, I probably would run and throw myself behind a bush and hide and, and then maybe have a bit of a panic attack. So, you know, even though you're firing someone, I think you can still do it in a way that's not, you don't have to destroy someone, you know, you don't have to do it in a way where they are left with so little confidence or so little, um, you know, you are damaged them basically, just because it's not right for your environment or they're not right for your, um, that industry, you know, you can still let someone walk out of your door in a way, you know, where they can go on and flourish somewhere else. Yeah. Not that they're made to feel like you're incapable of doing nothing. And so I always think about that when the way that I deal with yeah. people, the decisions that I make, you know, can completely change them from, you know, going on to amazing things or, you know, so I think you have to be very careful with words and you have to be very careful with the way you treat people. One of the ways that I used to think about it, I still kind of do think about it this way. Tell me if this kind of makes sense to you or I should work on changing my mind sometimes when you have to let people go we did this about two years ago and the chat I was having with Alina is that as business owners or bosses we owe it to some people to let them go in the sense that if they are their performance is lagging they are treating work like it's a chore um, they are always on their phone during the day like as you said like person's not into PR kind of thing right so that kind of wake up call when you're 22 years old is necessary and someone has to do that. And, th and I feel the same way with criticizing people. Like I don't, I'm not anti-criticizing. I think there should be criticism because the eyes of a secondary person are always looking at the whole picture more than you yourself would be. So that wake up call, even though it's so hard to do, we kind of owe it to our people to wake them up so that they can go learn and then maybe come back if they, if, as you said, leave them with a good note. Yeah. No, I've had people I've had people leave and after yeah. they come out even two weeks later saying thank you for firing me that was the best thing you could have done for me I've done that to bosses too that <laughs> let me go I'm like thank you that really changed me yeah because sometimes you just yeah. won't make that move over you know so yeah. you do have to sometimes just let people free to go on a different path so. absolutely and I think you know when, when we talk about HR as business owners we look at HR differently right there is HR textbooks that you were talking about that has a lot of terminology and at the big companies they kind of operate that way then, I don't know if you see this trend now, but they call them now VP of people instead of people, HR. People and culture. People and culture. But what I'm hearing you describe, and tell me this is right or wrong, for you, it's a matter of the heart. Like you are present, you are caring, you are listening to people, and you're really operating from your heart and your gut. 
and that's that's the difference i find in all these business books that define you know this is the the gantt chart for that and this is the you know the trough of this and um but i think also it is it comes from the top and yeah. i think there's too many a lot of people that i hear from even people that come to my company work for others and you know i think it, it surprises me how many people don't realize it actually comes from you um because you know it shouldn't just be your your other line managers that are you know because ultimately they're going to take it from you and it filters down so yeah. that's why it is yes it is run with a heart from me but it is like you know i'm seeing it for like from the top then i pass it down to my next reports and then you know it filters down throughout the whole business um so that i think um that is like you know people first um you know the and and you know living and breathing what you do is you know to me is that that's some of the key things to success absolutely and i think we can talk about teams and team building i, I want to do a round two with you because that's a whole another conversation on its own big part of at least our service business people are super important i want to talk about mentors the other kind of people who do you call most at 2 a.m for business advice <laughs> um so it, it's funny um i have never had a formal mentor i get a lot of people ask me to mentor them now um so um and that i take very seriously too i don't i don't do a great deal um generally it's my other friends that have got other businesses now i you know generally i find that my friendship groups have definitely changed um and who i hang out with now and it isn't just you know, i still have friends that don't own their own businesses but i would say who in terms of my closest friends and confidence um they are people that they all have their own businesses i think because we get it we might ignore each other for weeks even months because maybe we we're at a critical time but when we come back together you know it's exactly as it was before so i have one of my you know best friends here um you know she's got her own business we're both 5 a.m club people so we always we have often do zooms and talks at 5 a.m in the morning um, so I, I definitely think, you know, I have a client of mine and I always joke that if I needed to get out of jail, um, it'd be him that I phoned. Um, he's also like amazing. Uh, so I think it really, really, you know, it varies and depends on what it is. Um, but I, you know, I am surrounded by, I have got lots of really close friends who also have their own businesses at varying stages. And being honest, I actually now I find that I've probably got one of the biggest businesses out of my group of friends and so I'm a kind of at a different stage as well um, and I think you know I have started like leaning on some of my clients more who have got businesses that are at the next stage or a lot bigger because then you kind of you do want to speak to people that are um, you know that are going through the things you're about to go through um, I recently got accepted into YPO now a YPO for me was uh, I think I got to that stage, you know, where most things in my life I wanted to do apart from my book I've done. YPO, um, obviously, you know, it is one of the most prestigious um, kind of, you know, mentoring and kind of CEO, sort of senior leader groups. Um, the criteria is super, super strict. Uh, it's really tough to get into. But I kind of, you know, I decided it was something that I wanted to do. And I and I got in. And I, I mean, I did have a proper imposter syndrome even about that for about two weeks. I was like, they, they let me in. Are you sure you want to let me in? Um, um, but then that, that for me, was because that opens up access to people across the world I was about to embark on opening up other offices and I wanted to have access to people that had gone through the same thing as me because at the time I didn't really have anyone around me who had been opening offices in multiple countries and I was slightly freaking out about that and the reality of running in different time zones and just having people even your sort of senior leaders in different markets that you know you were on the ground with uh so yeah i have kind of definitely been getting a different circle around me recently of people that have got experience with bigger businesses and international markets because that was something that i felt i needed someone that i could call at any time and just ask advice from yeah. how do you derive the full value of that kind of relationship is it um how, how do you make them continue to respond to you because you can I'm, I'm asking as a personal struggle, right? Like there are a few people that I lean on to very heavily to a point where I'm over leaning on them. And I'm always a guy. I'm very close to becoming the guy when they see my name on the phone. They're like, oh my God, he's, he's in trouble again. <laughs> what did you do now, name? Um, yeah, how do, you ma- how do you maintain the balance in that kind of relationship where it, there's mostly a take and not much to give, even, especially if they're like at a different stage than you are? How do you manage that? I think I, I am always very mindful of like I don't want to be a drain to anybody right I mean I know that even you know maybe 
on the roles reversed you know I have people that maybe do that to me but I'm always generally I would always try and give as much as my time as I can I'll be very honest and say look I know I'm just I just you know um maybe like you know I, I can't I've got time this week but let me you know if we can sort next week and everything I don't know I, I guess I am very conscious of the fact that I don't ever want to I'm not very good firstly at asking for help at all so that doesn't come naturally to me and so when I um you know so I guess maybe I'm very conscious and I never kind of would want to sort of do that um I feel like probably maybe it's my lawyer who gets the most kind of um you know sort of messages from me from everything from you know business things to someone injured my cat can I sue them um, and he and he's very tolerant with me um and he doesn't always charge me <laughs> um but you know, I don't know I, I think I just always keep it really because I think I've, I'm in that situation a lot now I always but most people I find will give their time quite freely as long as you're not being cr- crazy with it um i think everyone's been there and i think there was a particularly here there's such a culture of entrepreneurship and we've all been through it and i think if people have genuinely been on your journey they get how it is and they can remember what it was like being in your shoes so they will always find time um or they will at least manage expectations you know at least i i I don't know i I feel so anyway well that's that's what one of my friends uh, told me here is like eight out of ten people in dubai are business people so like you're not going to run out of help that you need exactly at the start at least um i want to talk about next um working in the business slash on the business and the blurry lines in between um let's start here do you have a job description for yourself um like an official job description that you review? Well, Polly and I decided we were going to write job descriptions for ourselves. We actually did. Yeah, that was something we did. I don't even know what prompted it, but I think we, I think maybe we read one too many book and we thought we should have one. Um, and um, so I think we actually probably have got something on the server somewhere. Um, whether we looked at it for in a while, I don't know. Um, and that's the kind of, I mean, the thing I, I always say, right, that I, I am very, very hands-on. I joke about this sometimes, but it actually is quite true. I love the PR job and the communications job. I am, you know, creative. I love coming out with campaigns. I love pitching media. I love getting a front cover. It's like I say to all of my team, if the day comes when you're not excited by getting a good bit of coverage, you shouldn't be in PR. Uh, And I still now, if I get really, really good coverage for a client, I'm super excited, you know. Uh, And I, so I love doing the job, which is what I've been doing for years, a lot more than I like running a business. Um, you know, I don't like finance and accounts. I don't like HR really. Um, and all like, you know, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I just, a lot of the, and I do joke that particularly when I've got to the stage where I've got now and the size of business I've got is I end up, all I end up doing is the terrible stuff and I don't really get to do the things that I love and that make me happy as much as I want to. So I've kind of had to really consciously, I had this, have this discussion with Polly all the time because she's probably the other way. She actually really, you know, um, likes doing like, you know, I'm not saying the hiring the fine, but she's kind of probably enjoys that side of things more than I do, and she doesn't really like being day to day. So, uh, but I, to keep myself happy as well, because you've got to be happy when you're running a business, yeah. So I actually do always have usually a couple of clients that I work on personally. Um, but generally, I will ch- I've chosen who it is I work with. Um, you know, for example, Lighthouse Arabia, the Mental Health and Wellbeing Centre. You know, my background, obviously, I started off in psychology. That's something I'm super passionate about. And it runs through everything you do. And so I actually have looked after them for six years personally. I do everything, you know, on them. Um, and it is because I genuinely love that. And I love the founder and CEO. She's an amazing entrepreneur. And I enjoy working with her. I have. So I cherry pick a couple of clients that I at least can work with day to day. So at least I feel my hand is in and I am enjoying. That helps me enjoy the the rest of it, which I enjoy less, I guess. Um, so I do believe that. And I, but something else I really, really believe in wholeheartedly is that I want to be able to know how to do every job in the business. And it isn't because I kind of want to be able to do all those jobs because most of them I don't. But I also feel that I'm very much from that kind of, you know, roll your sleeves up, do whatever you've got to do to get things done. No jobs too, you know, small. And so, yeah, you will see me at events packing gift bags and you will see me if I have to. Um, And if anything, yeah, no, I do. I have to rein myself in from being too hands on. But I want to know that I at least understand the process behind every job in my business so at least when people are talking to me about things and maybe they're talking about you know amount of work or things like that I've got an understanding in my head of what how much that task takes or something like that so um, I mean there's things now I mean obviously you know we've got a really big digital team and 
even though I'm, you know, in terms of strategy or understanding digital, I have a good oversight. Do I, un- I mean, and as you know, SEO and, you know, Google and, and social media, it changes like daily. And yeah. so am I keeping up to date with everything daily and knowing the sort of latest to what it looks like? No, um, because I have, you know, obviously I have a director that heads up and I think, but I have a good enough overview. So yeah, I don't, I probably couldn't tell you how to do SEO today, but I have a, at least a knowledge and everything. And so that to me is really, really important too. Yeah, I think I think it's really important. Uh, she's smiling throughout this because we are kind of in this journey as well of how do we, you know, we're all, we're all going to end up wearing all the hats at some point, but there are some hats that we enjoy wearing more than the others. And someone once told me that if you don't make your job description, it gets chosen for you. Uh, and before you know it, you'll end up doing things that you don't want to do. And uh, advice for other people is uh, if you're like Alina and you don't like finance and HR, just hire your husband because <laughs> they really like, I, I like the numbers. He doesn't like the numbers. I keep track of margins, but I think we're kind of trying to do the same way what we haven't fully done. And I think your that advice is great is kind of educate each other on our roles. So if I know the operational layout of the business, I want her to know it as much as possible as well. If she knows how to do great ad campaigns, I want to learn what makes the best ad campaign. And we haven't had that cross uh, communication for, I'd say, a year now. Before that, when we were right at the start, we were doing everything together. But we started kind of going separate ways. Um, How do you bridge that gap like how do you maintain your knowledge enough of different parts of the business is just having chats is it doing something like asking for reports or how do you keep your pulse on all the different things even though you don't want to do them day to day how do you know enough I think, I mean, I, I'm still in enough meetings, um, you know, um, big clients, you know, you're still there, they, they still like to see a presence from me. And the reality is, yeah, I mean, that's a whole other conversation about sort of how you start to, when you end up with have a few clients that all buy you, it's one thing, but when you end up with 90, it's a very different thing. Um, and not being able to be everything to everybody. But um, I, you know, I do keep my hands on meetings. As I said, the one-on-ones I have with my team every week, you know, I kind of, you know, they're sharing things. I'm very much a believer in continuous education. Um, I love LinkedIn learning. I'm a bit of a geek uh, I will try and like you know at least do something on LinkedIn learning every week like half an hour an hour that's actually um, my next question how do you improve yourself in a way that you're useful to your business let's talk about learning yeah if you want to go into that no I mean it is super yeah. super important you yeah. know I mean I joke about being old now and everything but obviously like you know and I say to my team all the time like you know I remember the days when we used to fax press releases and uh, you know and they look at me like you know yes you're very old um, but it's like you know and but I feel you know I, part of me I you know I love I kind of like I love the kind of you know the journey that I've had and everything I feel that's kind of given really good foundations but I think you have to um keep learning because things particularly in communications digital changing all the time and you can't just sit there and and I think this is something that a lot of agencies or even people in the communications industry are struggling with right now is because uh, and we're having massive sessions at the agency at the moment about future proofing and what does the future of our industry look like because with the demise of traditional media for example um you know the increase in influencers love them or hate them it's like you know okay what happens if the day that comes where there is no traditional media left you know what what does it look like and even now you know the way that traditional media is is changing you know the way and content and paid for you know even like most of the traditional media outlets are all charging for content so I guess you know the landscape's changing so much so you have to keep learning and innovating and you know because that's the only way your business is going to survive um there's too many businesses I see that are still like purely they okay they don't do influencers they don't do digital they're only purely doing traditional PR and that is the most risky place to be in today um and that's something that I mean I know that my age agency Tishash we're known for being very creative and innovating and that's something that you know I mean my MD Polly she literally says that if I for example like take a week off or I have a long weekend for Eid or something she knows I'm going to come back with like four crazy ideas that uh, with a little bit of time off I've kind of thought about these things or if I have a sleepless night for example it's because like something's like you know my mind's going over time and that's why you know I'm very much I come with all these insane ideas or what about if we do this and then she reigns me in slightly maybe we'll do one or two of them um but it is I think that kind of creativity and from only learning reading um that's how you um you know you do kind of evolve and I think in terms 
terms of what else you know I'm doing personally I mean yes I, do, I am a massive fan of LinkedIn um I think it's you know there's so many reasons why I love LinkedIn but I feel like in terms of consuming content reading reading so important um and I'm you know I do start the day by reading you know I'll go on LinkedIn maybe look at a few articles people have shared maybe I'll look at the newspapers um and so you know I know we live in a in a generation now where people are on TikTok or Snapchat. And I know that there are some very, very great people doing things, even business-wise, on TikTok. I'm personally not on TikTok. Uh, and I've got no intention of being on it. Um, but for me, I love reading. That's where I can... But I think where, regardless of wherever you're consuming your knowledge or everything, um, like uh, some of my friends are really big into podcasts. I'm less so. Um, I think maybe it's because, like, for me, like, I don't drive. And so usually, you know, a lot of people listen to it in the car or they'll go running or, I don't know, I think m- with my lifestyle, I don't feel podcasts really work too you know it's not something I consume a lot sometimes during COVID I went through the Oprah phase and I did all of her ones but uh, that was COVID uh so I don't know I yeah I, I think it is just you know you can't sit still you always have to be learning absolutely you just have to be I think your personality kind of matches that because you just come across as very someone who's very curious um about a bunch of things not just in your little hole and just, just a little box that you're in so um, I want to talk about books at the end of the show. I want some recommendations that we go. I do want to talk about time management. Um, I was kind of debating on how long we should talk about time management because, you know, that's ironic. But um, you come across as someone who has infinite time. From And I know, I know of you from COVID and that's how we got to know um, each other was through the SME Rise collective that you started. Um, so I want to talk about SME Rise. I just want to tell you to tell the story of what the idea was and what the result was. But I also want to know that what do you know about time management today that you didn't five years ago? And what beliefs have you changed about that? What are you now not okay with? What are you okay with? Um, what has remained the same in your philosophy of time management? Uh, so yeah, so maybe we can start with the SME Rice because I think that was so awesome what you did there. Thank you. You can tell us the story of that. I think, you know, um, I said like two and a half years ago when COVID hit, I think um, none of us could have imagined that we're even still in the place we are today and it's still a thing. Um, when it hit, like most agencies, um, you know, we had 80% of our clients pause contracts overnight um, and... It was a very, very scary place to be in. I think, you know, I did a fair amount of like, you know, for the first two weeks, I think I did like cry on the carpet at home and thinking, you know, everything that I've built, um, you know, particularly when you've got a team, you know, I think I probably had about 24 people at the time. Um, And, you know, when you take people's response, you know, livelihoods really, you know, seriously, it was very, very scary being left overnight with, you know, 80% less revenue uh, and from your clients. So um, I think people deal with things in different ways. Um, I'm very much like, you know, I am, I don't know, I'm always thinking of different ways. And I think, and I, my approach to things generally is I feel better by doing something positive and helping other people. So at the time I, you know, I I just, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I was like, I've got to do something. I've got to do something. And obviously there was people doing great things in different areas. But for me, I was very, very tied into the SME community, but I, you know, I, you know, I do do a lot of mentoring. I do a lot of workshops and training for SMEs. So, and that was where most of my friends or people that I know that were being affected and marketing ultimately is one of the areas that when everything, you know, people cut back, marketing is just cut straight off. And obviously, exactly. And it it shouldn't be. Um, But ultimately when you are choosing between paying your staff versus paying for marketing you know it makes sense um and so I came up with this kind of crazy crazy harebrained idea and what it even started as versus what it ended up as was very different but ultimately um we formed a collective of people to come together um to offer marketing services to other SMEs um with a kind of you know idea that SMEs could apply for marketing support and other kind of marketing um companies could come together and offer their services so people so for example you know we opened it up SMEs could say like for example there were lots of SMEs that didn't have a website and or and they were you know all of a sudden they were left with nowhere to sell their products so we had other um, SMEs in marketing that came and built them a website and we had people obviously everyone needed everyone needed leads they needed business so we had you know sort of lead generation experts like yourselves you know and Alina who obviously came through and then they helped people get really important 
at Leeds, which all of it was about survival. So um, over it, the course, of it actually ran for, I think it, st- it started very, we were, we were very, very quick to do something. Um, we, I, I think we helped in the end over 400 SMEs um, with a broad, th- you know, from a complete cross section of, um, uh, you know, um, things that they needed. We had, I think, you know, it was, we had freelancers, we had agencies, regional and global, that all gave their time really, really freely. And I think it was a really, really, it was, wasn't about the time for me about, you know, competition in terms of, you know, we all just rallied together um, and we tried to create a positive change and support some businesses um, through a really, really tough time. And yes, I was having my own struggles and but I kind of agreed with Polly, my MD. I was like, OK, if you can just focus right now on the operations of Tish Tash and like that, I'm here, obviously, but like just you focus on that and I'm going to focus on doing this because this is what I really want to do at this time. Um, and I, you know, I mean, yes, we, d- we, you know, uh, even now I'm super, super proud of the work we did and, uh, and I, but I think ultimately, you know, it, whilst it did come from a place of wanting to do good, sometimes that's my character and I feel it may, it helped me get through COVID by doing something positive. Um, I think if I hadn't have done that, um, uh, you know, uh, maybe, I don't know, my anxiety would have been much worse, but it gave me something positive every day to to focus on. I met new people. I've got people who I met, like yourselves, in COVID that have become my close friends. You know, I've got in fact, some of my closest friends now I met through SME Rise in COVID. Um, it created a sense of, you know, a community. Uh, there was so much positive that came out of it. Um, a lot of people, like, since have said to me as well about SME Rise, you know, or was that your tactic to get through you know for new business or to get through because the reality is my business did grow 50 percent through covid but that was definitely never ever the just dis- when i you know i had my crazy thing which came to me at night i didn't do it with okay i'm gonna do this and then i'm gonna look good and it's gonna get me loads more business it genuinely was like i felt helpless a lot of us felt helpless i really wanted to do something to make a difference um and you know if Obviously, my business grew through COVID, um, you know, as a result of that or in part. Karma. Well, I think, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, everyone had an equal platform. I mean, I mean, I say everyone had an equal platform to choose what they did in COVID. Um, but I I was going through a super, you know, at the end of the day, I didn't pay myself for over a year, um, you know, and and. We, you know, these are the decisions you make when you're the boss, right? It's, I wasn't living it up in COVID. You know, I was literally, you know, me and my husband, my husband's self-employed as well. Both of us had a really, really, you know, tough time. Yeah, we put our, um, you know, we got a payment holiday and our mortgage. So we didn't have that. Um, you know, yeah, you know, we, we weren't, so we made, you know, sacrifices and we um, lived a very, very frugal life through COVID to survive both of our businesses. Um, But, you know, we chose to, you know, give our time to do something positive. Um, And I am really, really proud of what we did. I want to tell you that will never be forgotten. It's not by us, not by any of the people that you impacted there. And I wanted to use this opportunity to thank you because that helped us a lot. Um, as an SME, even though we went in with the same vision as you, like, let's just help people. Yeah. Um, and Alina was actually alone at the time when she started talking to you. I had come on just around that period where she started working with you. And it was our first idea was the academy that we had set up. And we wanted students, we wanted to teach business owners to do their own advertising so they don't have to, have to hire an agency exactly. or hire people. Yeah. And that really took off because of SME Rise and the webinar that we did together. Yeah. I mean, what you were doing was so important in terms yeah. of lead generation. Most people wanted to be able to do it themselves, right? And yeah. they'll always be, I always say, like, I've done loads of t- teaching with uh, how to do your own PR. Mm-hmm. Um, and everyone says, why are you doing that? Because then nobody will use you. I said, but there's always people that are going to want to do it for themselves. And there's always people yeah. that are going to want to hand it over to an agency. Just because you're empowering people at a time when they really need it with some skills yeah. doesn't mean it, it, you know, it um, you know, negates your own business. Uh, I think that's really important. Yeah. And back to the thing that you said, you need to know how every area of your business runs. So I think it's important for business owners to know what advertising, what the amount of work it takes, why it costs that much, how much work is it to do it well in-house or how to even manage an agency. You need to know enough so that you can manage your agency well. You need to have a partnership with the agency. So that's 
really important. So we still recommend business owners, even if you're not going to start pushing buttons on your laptop to run ads, at least get under the hood once and just Tater. look at what it takes. Um, time management, time. though. <laughs> what have you learned um, over the last five years or what is the biggest belief about time management that has changed for you? If you compare yourself to, let's say, 2017, 18 to now. I'm, I am very, very organized. I am very, very OCD about things. Um, everyone, I do it all the time, even like, <laughs> even you know, my MD like said to me, like, I've never known anyone with such a capacity of work as you. Um, and I don't necessarily know if that is true, but I know I do get a lot of stuff done every day. But some, sometimes I just assume everyone has the same capacity as me and just gets things done. So that to me is just normal in the way I've always been. Um, I think making peace with the fact that you're never going to have an empty to-do list is something that I I do think about a lot because I'm very the way I write even now I do this I obviously I have lots of lists I'm very into colored post-it notes that's what I kind of you know people have different ways of doing things I'm still very I like written I like you know so uh, other people obviously like online I you know I like notebooks in meetings other people still like to tap notes on laptops so I think it is a personal style thing but I uh, everything I have detailed lists it's color coordinated I have even times marked out my diary for certain things um, so I'm very much like that I have a policy where I don't go to bed at night or I don't until my inbox is at zero um, hey, we're the same. <laughs> and it's like even it doesn't mean you've got a no to do list, right? It just yeah. means that you're, um, you know, everything. You've dealt with everything's it. on a to do yeah. list. Everything's actioned, and that to me, that when you know when you see that thing in your inbox, where it like does the celebration, and it's like yes, it's empty. I and know. Then, I, just, I was going to show that to you, but I have two new emails while we were exactly. talking, so I can show you a zero inbox right now. But that's one of those things that to me that makes me really happy. Yeah. And then I go to bed knowing that. I mean, I wake up in the morning and I'll be full again. Um, <laughs> but I, I, you know, it's those kind of things that the certain things I know that make me really happy or and you know uh and those little rituals that I kind of get into and even like one of my closest friends who's got a business she now does the same because she said to me like I'm just never gonna get to the bottom of my to-do list and I, or my inbox and I was like well how are you looking at your inbox because if you're just keeping everything in there forever that's actually you know you can action it in different ways so it actually can be empty but then you know you've got lists or flags and things like that so I think the thing for me I think yeah making You've got to find a way that works for you to manage your time as well. What works for one person? I even do this with my team now. It's like I can teach them different techniques about um, orc time management, but what they're going to resonate with is going to be different to what somebody else resonates with. So you've got to experiment with different things. Um, yeah, making peace with the fact that you're always going to have stuff to do because the reality is if you're a business owner and you're sitting there with zero to do, there probably is something wrong. Um, and so even now it's summertime, right? And everyone's going to buy, you know, summer, I'm going away for like, you know, are you quiet? And I'm like, no, um, because I'm very much like, I am looking at future proofing my business. I'm like, you know, I've got projects that I'm looking to launch in the autumn that needs a lot of prep. And so I'm still working like as normal. I mean, I've got less events, so that's a lot less pressure, but I'm busy. And I know that my character is, if I wasn't busy, I would be, I probably have anxiety but um you know i think there is never enough time you can always find more things to do with your time but you've got to um and i think i guess the sort of obviously the side of this is about like work-life balance i guess right is something which entrepreneurs we always talk about um and it, that is still something that i struggle with you know um me and my husband, obviously, as I said, we're both self-employed, but we both have jobs that are very different and vif different working hours. So that's something that we still juggle with and we still kind of, you know, having enough time for each other. Um, I mean, I said, obviously, in the past, you know, I have worked seven days a week and I did that for a long, long time. Um, but now my husband and I, we have a policy like my husband works Sunday. So we have Saturday now, which is our one agreed day where we, you know, we don't open laptops and we don't work. And I mean, yeah, obviously, you know, two days off or even, you know, I mean, technically we work a 4.5 day week at work. Uh, generally, you know, I mean, it's Friday today. I'm here. I'm, you know, usually I will try and do something for myself on a Friday afternoon, blend it in with work. But um you know I'm very very strict on a Saturday now so we have our time together but otherwise you know I you know you do do what you need to do for your business absolutely um, and I didn't realize the truth of what you're saying when I was employed right especially with the quality of time that you have left and the quantity of time that you have left, and the fact that no one's telling you to as a business owner no one is telling you to do anything 
you are your own boss, which is a gift and a curse. And if you're not very kind to yourself, you um, allocate all free time towards this project and that. Pro and when you're sitting and writing, at least it's true for me, when I'm writing down these ideas of things to do, like you said, you go away for four days on eat break and come back with these four crazy ideas. At the time, when I write them down on my list, I have to do them. And I'll hold on them for a few weeks. So I want to ask you, at what point do you start culling tasks? Like you had a good idea or you thought you had to do something and it's been hanging around your task list and you never get it done. Um, when do you realize that, well, that's out of the list. It's gone. I'm going to color code it black completely and never look at it again. Or do you kind of persevere and push through everything that you've written down? I'm one of those people that if I say I'm going to do something, I will always do it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not very, you know, in terms of I've got quite good at my self accountability in terms of. So if I've put it on my list to start with, it will get done. Um, it does. As I said, doesn't always mean it's the greatest idea. And sometimes I've done things and I've kind of, you know, I've, I've, I've got them operational. I've done them. And then I'm like, actually, I don't want to do that anymore. Like yeah. I did it with like I obviously, you know, um, I've got my main Tish Tash brand, but then I've got Tish Tash Tots that focuses on kids and family focused brands. And I also had Tish Tash Talent that was a talent management agency. No one's doing talent here um, in the region very well. And um, I so, and obviously I had a lot of like radio presenters or people that wanted representation. And so I thought, you know what, no one's doing it well. And I, I could really do that well. Um, and I set up Tish Tash Talent. And we did it for a year. I invested a lot of money and a lot of time. It had full-time people working on it and it pretty much never made any. It didn't really make more money, but actually by the time you've taken your cut of like 10 or 20% of things, to be honest, it doesn't even like break even. Um, and it was, I, I, I hated it. I hated every minute in terms of people screaming at a, like 11 o'clock at night because their gig or kind of there was an issue or, you know, there was lots of things. And then I woke, one day I woke up and I was like, I don't need to do this. I'm not doing it anymore. And I shut it down. And I have never looked back once from shutting that down because um, it, it just, it genuinely didn't make me happy. It didn't serve me. Um, so I think while I'm just saying for the Jew list, I think my point there is that, you know, even just knowing when it's time to kind of move on, I think as I do really believe in gut instinct and kind of I go with my heart and I was, you know, I just thought I don't want this in my life anymore and so yeah I shut it down and, and you know and we could have you know generally we were doing a good job and we could have if I'd really invested time and into it we probably could have made a lot of money but it wasn't what I wanted to do but I tried so do you have a large graveyard of such projects I don't graveyard? actually no I genuinely <laughs> actually don't yeah. um, most things I would say um, that was probably I think one of my biggest things that I started and not um but most other things, um, you know, have put, gone on to, you know... See them through. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, even, you know, this in uh, my... I launched a magazine a year ago. Um, that was something that I'm... I'm a massive fan of magazines, as you'd imagine, because I like reading. Um, and so... And I know maybe I've watched too much Bold Type or Devil Wears Prada, I'm not sure, but always wanted a magazine. Uh, and then so, I know, and particularly with content is, you know, in, in the communications industry, content is the future. And so... And I had very, very firm ideas about what I wanted to do. And I thought... and. I decided, yeah, I'm going to open a magazine. Um, and it was, it, that was also, to be honest, I've been thinking about it for a year until I did it. And then one of my friends who is a, you know, a fantastic um, editor lost her job. And, um, it, you know, it was kind of still in the COVID era and it all just came together. Which her, um, her vision for it was very similar to mine. And so we launched Ramona, um, which is about keeping it real. Um, That's R A E. E M O N A R A E yes okay, M O N A dot com, and we are all about having the conversations that you have with your you know that you're either having in your head and don't want to say out loud or you're having with your best friend on a night out. Um, you know we talk about everything from IVF to money, um, you know divorce, parenting, um, you know, even like, I think some of our most well-read articles are like, some days I hate my husband or, uh, you know, horrible bosses. We have a career section as well. And so I really, really, you know, I mean, I love things like Harper's and Vogue and I love looking at beautiful editorial and handbags and aspirational things. But, you know, the, I, I, did, I felt there was a real gap in the market here for real honest chat. And 
the we're just about to turn a year old um it's doing phenomenally well the i think the average like dwell time on the on the site is like nine minutes or something because our articles are really really long we've got amazing writers um you know we've got a team here we also have some freelancers from the uk that are all published authors but amazing writers and i have you know i mean i'm being honest the magazine's a year old it's never made a penny because i was very much um you know this is i wanted to get the content right and i wanted to get the product right and i said i would only look at starting to monetize it from after a year so in relation obviously this is like one of my harebrained projects to launch a magazine but i feel really strongly that the feedback we had the other day had an email from a man who was kind of like saying that literally he wrote me a really long email which i couldn't i had to share with my team because i was like this is beautiful him saying like he responded to the article he read about imposter syndrome Mm -hmm. and so it's not just women but everyone like even the other day someone said to me like yours is the only magazine that i'm reading now because it is like that's what i want to read you know um we don't just want to hear about like you know i saying that life is rosy you know the reality is life is tough and so you know maybe we want to you know you want to hear that maybe someone else is being bullied at work you're not alone at that maybe you know something that i'm actually writing at the moment is the whole thing about you know oh you live in dubai you must be rich it's like kind of like the other day i went out for dinner with a friend and you know and they actually said you know we'd, you know had dinner and said like you know oh, you know we're really really struggling to like pay the bills and pay and it's like it's refreshing to hear someone say that you know when you're in a country where everyone's like you know you know i'm just going off for the summer on my yacht or i'm gonna go on my sixth holiday of the year and you know I, I like it when people keep it real and say things like that so i think so i, I definitely i'm really super proud of my magazine there's another one of my hair brain projects we've got big plans we're launching our own podcast we're going to do events um mm-hmm. kind of like very ramona style like networking and things like that we did obviously we launched our 40 over 40 i was very passionate about being able to advocate and champion women over 40 because I'm kind of sick of like 30 under 30 or I mean maybe it wasn't just because I thought maybe I didn't put myself in the list by the way um, um but I you know I kind of want to be out and we're looking at other lists now for even people in maybe mental health and things that actually got meaning um but that was something that obviously we did, we did it as the first year but then we're going to do it again next year and then maybe we will actually will be able to invite people to submit and everything. So last year we just did it on people that we felt deserved it and it wasn't necessarily just on people that had done their own PR well it was people that really really deserved to be in there um so um yeah so generally i feel like you know if there is something i follow through on what i you know i want to do so i want to get to that place myself too and the the struggle is so what i'm hearing right now and it comes very clearly across tell me if this is wrong but every kind of project that you're talking about has a meaningful impact not as much for you maybe initially not financially but it has some sort of an impact in the world um what's that's my guess of what the driving force is but where i'm stuck is that i i asked you about that graveyard because i've got a big ass graveyard of dead projects that kind of started with this first sprint or they went into the planning phase and or three tasks happen and then they get dropped for the reasons of like i need to pay the bills the diwa bill is it's summer it's not going to be low um family's coming there's trips to plan there's kids to give Edie to, and you start thinking about all the practicality, as you talked about earlier as well, about starting businesses. Um, I don't even know where I get stuck, but you know, what advice would you have that comes probably naturally to you to push through your gut feeling like this podcast, your guest number 10, this is the longest I've taken a side hustle project outside of the core business. Well, actually, no, we ran the academy for quite a bit of time as well before we shut it down. But we have this graveyard and her, her and I both, we've got these web properties we're sitting on, the ideas there, it's all like impact for other people too. Do you do all the initial work up yourself? Do you enroll help from people beforehand? How do you get accountability on your own projects and your crazy ideas to take them forward? I don't know. I, I think I, I just I don't know I think if I say I'm going to do something I'm really stubborn I'm a Taurus and I will make it happen and I mean I'm lucky like for example in my magazine it, you know I I briefed it into my design team I was like okay this is what I want to do I want a logo I want a brand identity so then as soon then you know like you know maybe a month later you're presented by your design team with like all your branding and then it's almost like it's become real and then okay well we go from that then we need to but even just names you know you start with like you know, I don't know I mean I am like stubborn and so it's like if i genuinely love it and believe in it and i I will make it happen um and i think i don't know that is just my nature um 
but it doesn't. I don't know. I'm trying to think. You know. Like what would you say your motivation to keep going on these side projects, knowing that you have, you know, your baby, which is Tish Tash, which is funding everything. Yeah. And that's it. And I, I know that for me it is a little bit different because I'm now at a situation with where I have my main business where most people couldn't just go and launch a magazine and know it's not going to make money for a year and staff it with amazing writers and things. But then I, I have another business which is funding that. So if you're starting from ground zero and you've got, you know, you've got to pay your bills and you've got to, that's a very different decision making than would I have done that 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have done because I wasn't in that position. But now, because I obviously, you know, you do have more choice and freedom to do things because you have, you know, you've got a bigger business that can kind of support things. Like at the moment, I'm looking at, you know, launching other things. And then, but that is, you know, that will be you know driven off kind of the back of my main business so I think it is you know you are you know it is a different place when you actually have got to pay the bills and as basic but I but I genuinely do think that if you you know your heart is in it and your gut instinct is right then you just have to kind of just keep pushing through uh, and you get over the stumbling box and you kind of find a way through um, you know whatever kind of stage it's at yeah I think finding ways to make it happen no matter what if you have that kind of mentality because you're right like when you're at a more precarious time in your business which is the initial peers where you're building your brand you're still getting your name known in the market and uh, your cash flow isn't as predictable as, as it can be uh, maybe it is harder do you remember in your first two three years attempting to have these kind of side projects and going full in into any of them? I don't think I did. Mm -hmm. I think um, for me, the first two years um, was very much, you know, I was just doing what I loved. I, you know, I had so many clients and it was very day to day. And I was just, I think at the time I was still probably amazed that actually I'd managed to, you know, not make it work. And I actually could, I didn't starve. You know, I'd got clients, I was doing a good job. People were saying we're doing a good job. Maybe it's back to that imposter syndrome. Um, so I think I was genuinely just maybe even though I was working really hard, it was on my terms to some to a big degree and it was working with clients that I wanted. Um, so I think that was a very, very different time, um, f you know, for me. Um, I think as well, like one of the things is, as I said, because I was going to yoga, I didn't plan on I didn't you know and so it's taken me a lot of time to build up confidence to actually think okay I'm not like a fraud like you know I'm not like um you know owning owning your success or owning like the your capabilities is really I think something which comes a bit of time as well um you know and something that I've had quite a few people like you know you know tell me off for like saying like stop like I don't know stop calling yourself a PR girl or so or whatever like you know you've really got to start owning your success and I think it, that's come with time as well and the realization that okay maybe I'm not going to yoga and they actually do have a brand and I have a business and I am building something which you know particularly then when you start getting into the stage where people come and start offering you money to buy you that's a whole other you know and that you know really really I think throw through me it's happened a few times and it's thrown me um because you know then it's, is that but is that self-belief okay I you know now maybe I am actually a business owner or I can do this so then maybe I can do something else it's not just so I think it does come with a confidence of running a business you know believing in your capabilities and um you realizing that you know it is actually in your control so maybe you're now you know you could go off and do something else or follow your heart that way um yeah if that it makes could, sense it could also be a factor of fulfillment right i'm just jamming out here but when you're um when you've derived full fulfillment from a certain project and it doesn't seem to be increasing at the same pace as, as it used to when the initial rush is kind of gone so we kind of search for that fulfillment somewhere else as well. well what if this was different what if this was um if had a different shape or a face but you brought up a good point about um self-belief and confidence i want to talk about the flip side of that the imposter syndrome, but from a very specific angle, though, have you uh, been in a place in the last 10 years where you just wanted to shut it all down? You just wanted to burn it to the ground, walk away from it, never touch it again. About like 10,000 times. Um, and I think and probably like even this year, you know, it's um, I don't think it goes away. I think, you know you love someday, you know, you love your business. And I do like, you know, I wouldn't have put the sacrifices and I worked on everything I've done if I didn't love my business but there's times where you do maybe you are having a bad day or maybe like you know 
where you you know you do question what you're doing um you know i mean yeah i mean covid i think for a lot of us was kind of a very much a time of um you know sort of reflection of reflection yeah. and what am i doing with my life um you know i think we've all we've all been through different I, I, you know i think we're always gonna um have that thing i mean on, like i mean you know i'm known for kind of speaking really candidly and honestly and i you know I've had, you know, my husband and I don't have a family and we have been through quite a journey the past seven years with, you know, we've had multiple miscarriages and we lost our daughter at birth and we've had a lot of IVF. And there's been times even in the, you know, a year ago, we gave up our mission to have a family of our own. And I have very, that's something that I'm still on a journey to kind of make peace with. But I went through a phase where I felt very angry with my own business because I thought, um, you know that my business had robbed me of having a family and even I've had to do kind of quite a lot of work on that or maybe you know even have the conversation or maybe you know if I you know get rid of my sell my business get rid of my business then I can have a family you know it's like so even like from it doesn't just go from the, the early stages you know you'll find you go through different phases and I mean mine's quite an extreme thing but I think um, you know it, it's something that I've kind that's something that I've kind of had to kind of you know l deal with as well um, because we all make choices but sometimes the choices that we make can have a real knock-on effect on the other side of our life you know and I'm always now you know very you know you always think you have time you know so there you are like living like you know having this big career and doing amazing things but then you always think you're going to be able to have a family and then actually you leave having a family too late and then it's not possible and so now I'm very much even with my team I kind of like you know I say like as long as you're in the right relationship and you're happy have a family you know make it happen there'll never be enough money there'll but never be enough time just you know because my perspective on even having a family and a career and running a business is very different now than it was um but yeah it, 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 you know so yeah I, I you know I've thought about burning it down many times you know just like you know I'll give it away to somebody or kind of um but ultimately I think you know I do love my business and I think that's the thing even when it takes you to the nth degrees of kind of you know I, you know it just sort of come back to you know why you're doing it and the, and the love for it and you talked about that earlier as well as advice to new business owners is figure out why you want to do this and attach that price to it because there is some sort of a price as you said there is always a um, cause and effect of some other area in your life that will go through that and we we go through this trouble quite a bit too where we're like looking at the financials or looking at the quality of life or looking at where we are spending our time who we're spending our time with that defines a lot and a certain amount of resentment sometimes fill, fills in right where you're yeah resenting the business but i think the love for the that kind of life or the problem solving life is what keeps us in it or at least for myself i can speak for it's the ability to take on challenges have a bad mood about it but still get on with it and do the work and see if you can solve it because that's what i think life in general is it's just no, definitely. one problem after that and you solve it in the challenge it's like a video game you have different levels, different bosses to kill at the end, and you keep, and there's no end. The end is, well, a blank screen uh, when that happens. Um, I want to talk, shift gears from business um, to something that most people don't assist, associate with business, but I think it plays an important role. Um, it's the ethics and the morality and the philosophy of business. I'm going to quote you. I read something online. You can fact check me. You can never believe what you read on the internet these <laughs> days. Uh, you've said, my mantra is always kill with kindness. So if someone is rude, unprofessional, or downright awful, rise above it, be professional and courteous. You will never regret it. I promise. So is that true? Is that something that sounds like I you? Did, I did say that. Okay. Yeah. So some would say that that's easier said than done, um, especially in cultures like here. Would you say that that kind of attitude is something that you've cultivated was it always a part of you? Is that something that comes from your family? Or have you had to kind of work on that kindness mantra of yours? I think in line with everything that I do, I'd say my business is a value-led business. I am very, you know, I think I'd say that's a lot of people looking at setting a business like that whole exercise about knowing what your values are is really important to do early on because that would dictate your journey as well. Um, I'm very, very clear on kind of, you know, where I am and what's important to me. And that's why I choose to surround myself with people that have got the similar or same values as me. 
likewise with clients I'm very you know very much the same you know and if any you know if I see people that I mean generally I said my gut instinct's good these days so I know if people are the type that I want to work with and so I would just cut it off I would even you know even in you know in the worst times even like in COVID you know we needed business if I met someone and every bit of my gut instinct was bad on them I would just not work with them um, because now my learning is in three times I've not followed my gut instinct in business and it's been terrible so now I, I do as hippie as it sounds I live it and breathe it I think you have to you know for me if you know what is right wrong and that is kind of you know that it aligns with you then the rest of it becomes really really easy so um you know from that's why obviously even in terms of things of me about how I treat my staff etc now you know I'm in an industry which is very very competitive there is probably over 200 PR agencies now um you know whilst obviously we've got name and reputation um you know the reality is you know we are in a very price sensitive market and um you know I've you know there's people all the time that will undercut you or you know the the way that they choose to run their business you know I I do struggle with sometimes because a lot of the ethics and integrity that I see is not in line with mine and I but I just try to say okay that's not I very much just keep in my own lane I live by my the rules that are important to me and I make sure that you know I you know that to me is you know how I want to live my life if people around me are just wild wild westing then whilst I don't like it and I don't and it can upset me and it frustrate me I just choose to live by you know what's important to me so yes sometimes you know that sometimes I you know get emails or or have communications with people that are so rude and so vile and awful and like you know I've had people that the way they've treated my staff has been downright horrendous degrading and you would not treat anybody like that um but you know I don't tolerate it but I would still always choose to manage that I won't come down to match it with the way that they behave I would still manage it professionally and you know I mean sometimes you think you know you never know what kind of what's going on in their world right you know it's those things they actually could be really you know there's the situations like that so I always try and look at it with actually you don't know what's going on in their world today maybe they did I don't know you kind of think you know maybe they lost someone they love maybe they had a miscarriage you know all these kind of things you just don't know or maybe they're scared for their own job and like where and they've got a family to support so I do try and always put myself in their position but ultimately I always choose to communicate communicate with everybody you know with respect integrity and and kindness because I that's me that's how I want to be and um you know end of the day you know I think you know the quote I can't remember you know the one about you know people don't they remember how you you make them feel and everything it is that to me is kind of you know that that's something that I live by you know we come from Canada which is I call it the coldest country with the warmest people the nicest people on the earth. Like you'd be waiting for a bus um, at a bus stop and someone would strike such a heartfelt conversation with you. Like they've known you forever and just give you these smiles. It's amazing to come from that to, we got a bit of a culture shock when we moved back to Dubai four years ago. And I feel, and maybe you can uh, tell me if this is right. I've, I've started to become that kind of person that matches the culture here. So the baseline in Canada is that you trust and respect everyone from from zero from knowing nothing about them yeah. and so then you give them your trust and then they basically rather than earning it that, e- yeah. exactly it's given freely and then over time you discover if you know it was worth giving or not over here what we've realized is the opposite your baseline is distrust we are not going to smile at people uh, at strangers that walk you know when we're walking a mall you never see anyone smiling at each other right and i'm i'm fearing that i'm becoming uh, a bit more attuned to that because it's, it's also the culture of where my parents come from. It's very similar. Like when I go back to the home country, I feel the same vibes. So what would you recommend uh, or just advice to people if they wanted to embody more kindness throughout the day? Um, w- maybe it is about biting tongues. Maybe, as you said, like putting someone in someone else's shoe. What are some small acts someone like me can do to just improve my... Um, sensibility around being kind more often i mean i do think that maybe you're meeting the wrong people because i i mean maybe it's because i'm from like uk and i think and that's one of the things i always say why i love dubai is because i found that people were very welcoming they were very we've all been expats at one time so everyone always like lets you in whereas you go to the uk most people have got their friendship groups and they're a long time and they don't let them in so i actually found dubai quite refreshing and i find here people a lot of people that i've met very enabling and so I've had, Jeremy, I would say a very positive experience. 
that said, I do know there is a lot of terrible behavior and there is a like, you know, particularly in the entrepreneurial kind of space. Um, so yeah, I definitely think you need to meet some different people as well. Cause I think there are some amazing people as well. You should cut um, people out of my life. <laughs> exactly. No, I, mean, I do that quite free, you know, I choose to who you surround yourself yeah. with. Um, but I don't know. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm that kind of, I've turned to that kind of person where I like, I do speak to people in a lift. Like, you know, like that's the most uncomfortable situation, right? Where you're in a lift and like no one's saying anything. And then I'll be that person going, hi, or like, you know, have, oh, like, you know, morning. Or like when you go out the lift, like have a nice day. I'm like, kind of like, I mean, without being in a completely cheesy American kind of like commercial, but like I do have like, you know, and taxi drivers, I love talking to taxi drivers. I think it's really important. I, I don't, I do drive, but I don't drive here. It's so like Uber everywhere. And mainly so I can like either, you know, email or as I go. I always talk to taxi drivers. They're some of the most fascinating people. Like, some of them have got the most incredible stories. And I met this taxi driver once. I'll always remember, he's writing a book. And, like, all of his stories and everything. Kind of, he's super educated. Even the year on a PhD. And, yeah, he's obviously he's taxi driving because he can make more money for his family. But he's writing his book with all his little tales from his taxi driving days in Dubai. And, I, you know, I genuinely always think about him. Um, so, I, you know, I think... We're so used to that. So many times I was like, you know, um, I don't know, like, I think they get a lot of like, you know, just this one example, taxi drivers, you know, a lot of people that just don't speak to them or are really rude, but like they find it really, you know, the other day they're driving people around all day and they want a bit of conversation. So I think even just, I mean, even just saying hello to somebody is not, you know, or adding a little bit of kind of cheer. Um, I think as well, I'm very, very, um, you know, my, I don't know, I... Uh, by that whole random acts of kindness thing so sometimes we do it at work we set random acts of kindness day and it's not on the official day and I say to everybody okay today you have to do something kind for a stranger so it could be like for example we did it like we had like really like loads of blank greetings cards I love like as I said get a trend here now it's like books writing cards so we all like wrote kind of some people they, they we um they wrote a, a card to maybe a client or someone that like whatever really like you know just, handwritten yeah and, like real kind of like things about kind of like you know enjoying working with them but very thought through our driver did it, delivered it that day um you know sometimes you know they, okay I'm gonna go and send maybe a box of like you know donuts from delivery to somebody or or, you know or even just random you know completely random acts um and i'll probably say you know when we do that we try we probably do it a couple of times a year it always everyone just always feels really happy and so it adds a bit of cheer uh, but i think it is just kind of small things really and um, that make a lot of difference yeah. um but just i don't know just it's human stuff right i love it i i want to embody and now that you've said it to me with these kind of lights i'm never going to forget it so there's I'm already thinking of the box of donuts and who I want to send it to right after we leave here. So no, exactly. Honestly, like I send happen. a candle even like with a really, you know, yeah. someone having a bad day that you know might even just a client just say something really flippantly and then like I mean I have my account for flowers is like insane now because I always send flowers to people. Yeah. Um, but like, just adding that bit of cheer to someone's day is really important. Yeah, and I love it when people do it for me. So I, if Think I could how be the you one feel, to right, and then like yeah. do it, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's going to be on the to-do list. And it doesn't need to be expensive. It could just be, you know what, you even yeah. like, even like you do an email, even just send something, actually a bit of a thought, just acknowledge someone. Really yeah. important. Yeah. Or a nice voice note on WhatsApp. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read another quote from you. It's, not, it's, oh, no. it's, a, it's a list and then a follow-up you question. You some finds my ones from like 10 years ago. They might, I might disagree with some <laughs> of those. <so. laughs> no, these are fairly recent, so they're not, um, you, you won't judge them too harshly. Uh, but you said... Your five rules. These are five rules that you live by. So always trust your instincts. They will not let you down. Treat your people well. We talked about this. They are your business and its success stands on them and your leadership. Collaborate. Don't compete. There is power in numbers and we cannot work successfully in silos. Lastly, always be kind. So I wanted, like, as you're coming up with these values, I'm sure you've written them down and thought about them extensively. I wanted to talk about uh, a core belief of yours that you seem to have changed your mind on in the last, let's say, six months to a year to two years, because our reality and perception of reality keeps changing as, you know, the computers inside our brains are being updated almost all the time. And there's things that we hold near and dear to our heart. I wanted to just I'm very curious if there has been some shift in a core belief or something that you look at completely different perspective now that you didn't, let's say, six months or a year or two years ago or have you been sort of consistent mostly I think I'd say for the past five years or six years maybe I've been quite consistent um I think you know, I know I did learn loads you know early years I probably as I said like I joke what I you know if you'd read something I've been quoted on like you know 10 years ago or eight years ago it'd be very different from I think what I think today um 
so no but i do i feel now i feel quite i have quite a very good sense of who i am and what i'm doing and kind of what i believe in um and i don't feel that has changed that much in probably the past six years okay and do you remember before six years what was a core belief that was shaken and that completely improved the way you live your life if there's one or two that you can remember um I think, I mean, a lot of it is more like, I mean, generally, you know, you always kind of have had the kind of values and kind of, you know, you've been brought up in a certain way. Um, but I think even just things now, like looking at people leaving your business and everything in a different way. Um, and even, you know, even maybe just now looking at clients leaving in a different way. Um, you know, I mean, you know, you never really want to lose a client from your business. But for example, if I look at kind of one of the key kind of pivotal things, you know, I, you know, I lost um, one of my, you know, biggest clients, they were probably I'd say, maybe for a long time, maybe 70% of my business. Um, and when we lost them, um, for something which actually was quite random, you know, it was kind of something uh, quite out of our control. I pretty much thought, obviously, I had the whole thing about, oh, you know, I'm going to lose my business. And I was very, very, um, you know, it, it was a very difficult time. Um, and at the time, obviously, it was the end of the world. You know, I pretty much probably went to bed for like two days, put a duvet over my head. And uh, But now, I mean, obviously, that was a very pivotal time for me in terms of learning not to have all your eggs in one basket. But now I would look at it particularly even when you do lose clients now which you know when you particularly when you've worked really hard you've done amazing things and you know sometimes you th- I mean there's obviously times where you know I'd say we're not faultless there's been times you know but maybe but generally a lot of the time they're out of your control it could be you know either so I think learning to look at clients leaving or even people leaving your business with a different lens is something that it's you know I would have taken it very very personally maybe like more than five six years ago and it isn't to say now it doesn't sting and it doesn't you know have that thing but I also look at it as I am a big believer in everything happens to get you to where you need to be Uh, like other people your staff have their own journey right they need to go off and experience other things clients need to go and experience other things maybe you were right for them at that time but actually now they need something very different I think you I look at those kind of things with a very different lens now and I try and you know um you know look at it as kind of not quite necessarily universe getting you kind of but that kind of you know I do believe everything does happen for a reason absolutely I mean think about reading a novel or a science fiction book which what I'm into that if you don't have those crap moments in between the story doesn't fit right if it was all just the same level then there's no point reading any further because there's nothing to resolve and later on everything happens for a reason and you realize that in all the stories and if i start looking at my life like a story then what you're saying like makes total sense and makes it a bit more colorful actually yeah and it is Um, and the thing with the business right it is it is the highest highs and the lowest lows and that's why you know and when you go into this you've got to be prepared for that journey because it's not all going to be sunshine and flowers it's you know i always say that having a business is like she taking me to my darkest places you know i've had a you know and then it is some of the moments where you're like you know wow this is like beyond what i ever imagined for myself in my life and i think it is um yeah that roller coaster that is the journey when you're signing up for this um you know and i think that's why people do fall off right because it's not just you know i had people that friends that started their business and they were like um you know oh, oh well, i've been in business for like maybe five months and i've not even paid myself <laughs> or i've like literally earned like a two thousand dirhams i'm like this is the reality this is what you signed up for yeah. or um you know it, it is and it's, it's that kind of thing it's like you know or yeah you get to a stage where you're like actually you know this roller coaster i can't deal with i that isn't what i i need in my life and so that's why they step off uh, you know and maybe go back to i know so many people that have you know stepped in and stepped off again um because they they wanted they felt that they they need that maybe they couldn't live with that um uncertainty or they needed that um more kind of like steady kind of you know sort of flat rope was more, yeah. more they wanted for their life so um and i think there's nothing good or bad with that i think the thing is you know they say like you at least got to have tried right and realize that that was either you know something that you could do or couldn't do like i said like you know this wasn't the journey that i planned and i didn't know you know that could have been me I, you know now I'm like just completely like you know I've shocked myself that I'm not like you know um you know I didn't even plan to have a business 
this big I didn't even plan to have staff and then now we end up with you know offices in three countries and then it's like um, you know that definitely was not in the plan so um, you know I think I've gone the other way in terms of shocking myself how I mean for years I kind of I pulled myself down as well and said to people like I'm not a leader I'm not a, you know I'm not a I didn't really own the kind of space I was mm-hmm. in and then you get to stage actually like, actually hold on I can't really say that anymore um, you know you've got to kind of um, you know keep saying like oh I don't you know I'm, I'm not capable of running a business or you know I, it's very easy I don't know I think it's part of the imposter syndrome thing right where you kind yeah. of like um but then you just get to a stage where actually okay maybe I do kind of know what I'm doing I have a bit more of a clue than I think I mean I'm still totally winging it sometimes you know um and that's I, totally fine exactly yeah. we're all winging it life yeah, we all are <laughs> so yeah <laughs> yeah um Listen, I'm marking a lot of things as R2, which is my code for round two, because we are running out of time and there are so many places I want to go with you in in this conversation. Uh, So I'll have to bring you back. Uh, There's a lot of more meaty stuff. I do have a rapid fire round. Okay. I want to do with you before we start to wrap up. Uh, You up for it? Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Number one, ice cream or gelato? Ice cream. All right. Number two, exciting flexibility that leads to volatile results or boring consistency that leads to sure results. Oh, I don't, that's one, tough. Huh? <laughs> I'm trying to like process that in my head. Probably this, oh, I don't even know. I probably would say the second one, which is boring, but I might go second. Boring consistency that leads to sure results. But I don't know. But that's then what your gut I'm, says. Yeah, but then at the same time, I don't necessarily think that's what I've done. But anyway, no, I'll yeah. go with two. Okay. Spa day or shopping? Spa day. Yeah, that was easy. Mm-hmm. If you weren't living in Dubai or the UK, where would you be? Um, probably uh, US. The US. Anywhere in the US? Always want to live in New York. New York. Favorite Netflix show of all time not released in 2022? Oh. I mean, literally, I, I, I joke that I've like done the whole of Netflix. It's... um. I mean, that's really, really hard. I mean, I, I, I love the bold type. I'll go with bold type. Okay, that's what you got said. Okay, the one book every business owner should read, according to you. Okay, that's really tough, I'm thinking. But actually, you know what? I'm going to say something you're probably not going to expect. I'm going to say, I think everyone should read Five Love Languages. Um, not a business book, um, but this is something that I, obviously, back to being people focused, obviously, I don't know how much you know about the book, but the idea is that basically we all have um, our way, a love language, a way of showing and experiencing love. Now, you're talking about love, but it, it can't, not just a romantic relationship, but actually it can just be a way of feeling appreciated. So I make it my business that everyone in my team, I try and get them all to read this book. And then we, I work out, I know what love language they are. So for example, I know that there's certain people in my team that like you know some one of it is like you know actually like words of affirmation is what really makes them feel like you know empowered so I know with that person then I know that that that's what they're going to respond to in terms of I want to make them feel really valued other people are like um gifts like I'm actually um gifting is my uh, one of my love languages usually you've kind of got one in a secondary one as well so I there's certain people in my team I know who likes a gift so maybe it will be like I'll give them like you know either some flowers or a lip gloss or something like whatever and then there's other things I mean one of them is like um was it like almost like can't think of the term of like that touch but obviously I'm not really a hugger so I'm kind of like you know I'm not really going to go around like hugging people in my team but um you know but basically if you learn and this is like not so if you learn how people feel appreciated and valued and that ultimately loved then that is revolutionary and I think everybody in the world should read that book not just people in business it is yeah. the most even like now I've got people in my team there's a kids book and they've all got their kids to read it as well it is I think it is just powerful that's amazing it's on my Amazon shopping list by the time we get it's really out of here short. you can do it in two hours oh amazing well see the, that's the thing with books I think every book is a business book really um, I read this um, six part series of a science fiction book and all I can see is leadership lessons in there even though it's a story about an army general who's training to fight a war, but you, you learn so much from every single book to apply it to yeah, that. True. Next question. If you were to stop working in PR, what would you be doing? I'd be an interior designer. Interior designer. Okay, we'll need to cover that in round two. Um, this could be a really long question. This answer can be really short or no, really long. No, we're doing quick fire here. Doing really badly. I know. We have, what, what do we have, Marwan? Four minutes to go? Two, you're cutting. You're you actually time me and throw me off. Wow. Wow. This because they, they charge me for every minute <laughs> I'm here. Big agency or small agency? 
there's too much to say here. I can't, <laughs> I can't do that quick fire. Do I have to do it on quick fire? If, <gasps> if it was to be on quick fire and I had a gun to your head, big agency small or small agency. Small, but that's not where I've ended up, but small. <laughs> <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> Um, no, I think I think we're running on on time. Oh my God, there's so much I want to talk to okay, you about. Well, I'll, I'll try and quick fire. Uh, <laughs> no, no, the quick oh. fires are done. Everything else is. So I want to talk about like decision making, how you look at day to day, how you look at long term. I want to talk about pricing. We didn't get to that. I want to talk about vision and vision setting. I want to talk about what's on the horizon for you, for Tish Tash. Um, I want to talk about my own struggles, like in in. You brought this up a lot of times and I want to explore it much further than we did today, imposter syndrome, because I think it really needs to be talked about and the difference between not being actually capable and figuring out and being really good and then having imposter syndrome. Um, but we'll have to do that in round two. Oh. I've been so happy um, in the last two hours to hear <laughs> your perspective. I'm not kidding. This It's so refreshing to hear um, because you come from an angle that, you know, just from the book that you recommended, Five Love Languages, you come from the heart to everything. And I think that is the base of all our decision making, whether you cloud it with how you run your house, how you run a relationship, how you run your business. It's all yeah. kind of the same. Right. So I'm I'm so glad um, I'm going to watch this episode and take more notes for myself. I hope you got value out of it, too. My biggest cheerleader <laughs> over there. Uh, and thanks for coming on. Before we cut off, is there a message for the audience of entrepreneurs, business owners, seasoned and new that you want to leave them with, or just generally to humans, if there's an ask, and if you can tell them where they can find you on the internet, if they wanted to know more about you, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I I believe for wholeheartedly, better to have tried something and failed than not. So, you know, you just got to give it a go. If you, it's what your heart is saying, your gut, give it a go. It could be terrible, could fail, um, you know, but give it a go. Um, you can find me. I have my own website, www.tashhatherall.com. Um, that was when I kind of, you know, everyone said I had to have a personal brand. So I have a website now. Um, but you can find me. Um, I'm very active on Instagram um, at Tash Hatherall and um, LinkedIn as well. Um, I'm very, you know, I'm on there every day. As I said, I love LinkedIn. So yeah, no, I, and I will always reply to your email or message same day. Because <laughs> <laughs> you got to get that inbox to zero. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on, Tash. You're welcome. No, thank you for having me. It's uh, nice to be able to talk about things, you know, from a different perspective. I, I hope that was fun and therapeutic for you. <laughs> no, it was. It's a good way to end my week. So. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed that conversation. Please do share this episode with someone you think will enjoy it as much as you did. To find out who else will be coming on or to recommend someone I should talk to, please follow my Instagram. It's at my first business podcast or go to the website myfirstbusinesspodcast.com. And that's all, folks. 